Good evening. My name is Lisa Steele, and I'm the Artistic Director at VTAPE, where we acknowledge we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations, Métis, and the Inuit peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this territory and treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Welcome to the Curatorial Incubator 16, Living in Hope, uh, perhaps an apt um, theme that we didn't know how apt it was when I developed it. Uh, throughout the fall and early uh, into 2021, we're going to be hosting eight different programs that respond to this theme. Since we're fully online, we'll post one title each week on a Friday, and at the conclusion of each curator's program, we will post a recorded Zoom conversation between the curator and the artist, which is what we are doing right now. Uh, this evening, we're presenting a conversation between incubatee, uh, Madeleine Bagash, and the artists John Paul Kelly, Steve Renke, Parastu Anushapur, Faraz Anushapur, and Ryan Furco. And I believe that uh, Faraz is unable to join us, but Parastu and Ryan are here on behalf of their title. Madeline, take it away. Hi, um, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and thank you everyone for joining me here today for this chat. So I thought I would begin just with some introductions. Um, so, Beginning with John Paul. Uh, John Paul Kelly is a Toronto based artist working in video, drawing, and photography. His practice questions the limits of representation by examining complex associations between found photographs, videos, sounds, and online media streams. Kelly received the 2015 Images Festival Award and the 2014 Kazuko Trust Award from the Film Society of Lincoln Center. He has extensively exhibited and screened works across North America and Europe, and is currently a visual studies lecturer at the University of Toronto. So, hi. Hi. Um, Paris Du Anushapur, Faraz Anushapur, and Ryan Ferco have worked in collaboration since 2013. Using various performative structures to work in relation to specific sites, their projects explore collaboration as a way to upset the authority of a singular narrator or position. Currently based in Toronto, recent film and installation work has been shown at Projections, Wavelengths, International Film Festival Rotterdam, International Kurzfilmtage Oberhausen, Portland International Film Festival, Experimenta, Crossroads Festival, uh, and Z ZKU, Center for Art and Urbanistics, uh, Gallery 44, Center for Contemporary Photography, Spaces Art Center, and Trinity Square Video. So, hi. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Steve Renke is a Canadian artist and writer best known for his diaristic videos, which express his desire and pop culture appraisals with endearing wit. During the 1990s, he was active in Toronto's artist run centers, uh, particularly YYZ and Pleasure Dome. He has taught at the University of Western Ontario, Cal Arts, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and the University of Chicago, Illinois. He is currently Professor of Art Theory and Practice at Northwestern University. He has extensive national and international exhibition history. In 2006, he was awarded the Bell Award in Video Art, and he has co-edited several books, including Lux, A Decade of Artists, Film and Video with Tom Taylor, uh, The Sharpest Point, Animation at the End of Cinema with Chris Gaiman, and Blast Counter Blast with Anthony Elms. So yeah, once again, thank you all so much for joining me here today. Um, and so maybe now we could just go around and you could each give a brief introduction to your film so that people who are watching from home can kind of connect a uh, face to name to film. Sure. And so maybe we'll just go around. Um, Steve, do you want to start out? Um, sure. Uh, the piece you're showing is a 14 minute piece, um, maybe 15 years ago, so maybe not that long ago, um, called Hobbit Love is the Greatest Love. Uh, it's in five parts, and it's um, it's it's in line with uh, a, a lot of my work, but it is the most directly satirical of my works. Um, so it, yeah, it's also I've done a lot of work, and so it's interesting to see what gets played and what gets passed over. When I made it, no one showed it, and then in the past three or four years, 
less than that in the past two or three years, it's begun to be shown quite a lot. Um, so I think it's, uh, it must be uh, the way it kind of speaks to the times. Um, yeah, which maybe I'll talk more about later. Awesome. Yeah, well, I'm happy to um, be showing it in its renaissance. <laughs> um, John Paul, did you want to go next? Oh, sure. Um, so The Innocence is a work from 2014 uh, that is a really kind of a three-part um, structure um, of a kind of collage or montage. Uh, the first being a uh, image stream of found images uh, printed on paper and um, moved onto the camera with my hands. And there's 46 of those. There are uh, images, these images are related through um, graphical relationships or sociopolitical re relationships um, that are often in flux. And um, that leads into a second part where uh, an actor reportrays um, or reenacts the uh, movements uh, of Truman Capote in uh, the Meisel's Brothers documentary um, uh, with Love from Truman from 1963, uh, in which Truman Capote talks about his um, process for construction of narrative uh, from reality. Uh, and then the uh, work ends with a uh, graphical animation of dots, patterns of dots, uh, that are related to the first section through the instructions of the second section. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Great. And then either Ryan or Paris, too, did you want to give a brief instruction to your film? Yeah, I can go. Um... Ours is Buntaku, it's five minutes. We made it in 2015 in Berlin. And I think it's not the first, it's one of the first things we made together. And since then we've been working together, the three of us. And it was a way, I think the film just brings together several bodies of images or archives um, that bring, there's a performative element where the three of us perform this obsessive retelling of a conversation where we record and then we go into the city and try to document images of what we thought each other said about the place. And, and then we there's a found um, family photograph album and there's a, a postcard that retells a family holiday. So all of these come together to try to tell something about that moment in Europe and its kind of um, relation to tourism, but also a feeling of doom or death that, that goes underneath all of it. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, maybe for my first question, I'll kind of uh, probe at some of the things that you mentioned uh, about Buntaku. So, um, I'd say like in contrast to the other two films, which at some point take this sort of first person, uh, like desktop, desktop perspective. Um, in Bantaku, there's a very dispersed sense of authorship. And in part, that is, um, like, like you said, part of this sort of collaborative structure of your practice. But then it's also sort of reinforced by the, um, like the centrifuge of sound and of image that you bring in, which seems to really sort of exceed any singular perspective, singular voice, or singular place. And so I was wondering if, um, if either or both of you wanted to talk about um, how you manage these sort of multiple and shifting voices in your work. Yeah, I guess I, I'll uh, start, with the, start with this one. Um, yeah, I know centrifuge is a nice word maybe. Um, and, and space, I guess, um, because we, I mean, our work, our way of working together and our desire of working together is really um, about how sort of three subjectivities can, can interact with um, one place or, or one history or one experience. Um, but then always the question is how you um, bring that material together in something that feels evocative, that feels generous, generous to an audience, that feels um, like more than something that's enclosed and indulgent for its own sake. Um, and so in the case of uh, Buntaku, um, where we've shot 
hours and hours and hours of material over two months um, in Berlin, in this case, um, we come back to Toronto and, and project it in a studio and do, create this sort of um, performative trance-like um, environment where we're reviewing, um, seeing, re-experiencing um, all this material that we've, we've made and, and sort of archived together. Um, but then it's able to sort of coalesce around someone else's uh, narrative experience, which is this found postcard, um, which is being live translated. And then, um, yeah, this sort of uh, affective space of, of, the, of music and sound that happens. Um, some of it's happening in, uh, coincidentally in space that we then edit it into the film. Other things are happening more um, in the, the collating process after of editing, but um, yeah, it's very, much searching for that that moment where like an emotional uh object uh presents itself to us great um paris do did you have anything that you wanted to add on to that um uh yeah maybe just that um the thing that i think brought the film together was exactly this moment of live translation where there is the pause in in the native speaking person trying to think what the word is and in this way everything becomes the very simple narrative of uh, a holiday becomes very open and disjointed and I think that's what helped um, all the images become what they are um, and I think that is something that we're interested in or that's something that glues all the images together is this attempt in communication that fails in the space that happens between um, making a sentence basically, but things just take on their own form and become something a little bit um, ominous, I feel like in this one, at least. Definitely, yeah. Um, I was wondering maybe if you could expand on the role of translation in your process. In this film, there is sort of like the very literal translation of um, the postcard read aloud and then also the sort of description of the visual of it. But it also seems like there's sort of different layers of translation happening. And especially that like emphasize the sort of like slippages that occur in that process. Right, Brian? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, beyond the, the literal translation that's happening. Um, I mean, there's so much kind of behind uh, um, that precedes this this film um, that allows those kind of intense five and a half minutes um, to present themselves to us. Um, but like Paris do mentioned, there like earlier iterations of us um, collecting material. We were we were recording conversations between the three of us um, about the city that we had arrived in and then um, tra or transcribing those uh, conversations and then taking those transcripts as, as sort of scripts and, and directions uh, for us to move through the city and use the cameras. Um, and so there's this process of, of trying to communicate effectively, translating um, an image in one's mind to the other person um, and that consistently failing and breaking down and being frustrating, um, sometimes um, getting further than you could have Im imagined something would go on your own. Um, but yeah, I mean, trans translating um, and communication and failure of communication um, is really sort of at the core of, of our collaborative work across uh, six years now. So. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's very sort of like an evocative, sort of effective ambiance in the film. Um, so I'll move on to my next question, um, which is for Steve. Um, so in the beginning of Hobbit Love, you sort of open with this update to uh, Adrian Piper's calling card project. And during that, I think there's a line where you say something like um, you dismiss the increasingly impossible category of autobiography. And so it's kind of building on the conversation about dispersed self. I kind of, I guess I get the impression from your work that when you, um, even though when you do say I, like when you're using the first person 
sort of stance that there's also a dispersion of that sense of self or maybe a composite. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of autobiography or maybe um, even autofiction in your practice. Oh, well, in many pieces and especially the more recent work, um, there's actual autobiography, which I avoided for the first 20 years of making work, um, although still in a complex, well, hopefully complex way. Um, the voice in Hobbit Love is, um, it speaks in the first person um, and it's a friendly enough voice, but it's also a satirical voice. Um, so it's always working from that kind of relationship or, or point of view, which is something not particularly personal. Um, it's kind of a, um, like a Swiftian modest proposal satirical voice, um, which acts friendly, but may not actually be friendly in uh, uh, what it's proposing. Um, so there are some videos where it's more difficult to think about them in terms of autobiography, um, like the video of the Mendy or something, because if that was me, I would be an asshole. <laughs> but at the same time, it, yeah, anyway. So I'm not sure how that answers your question, but. <laughs> no, no, definitely. Um, I'm curious, because you said you, you've recently started introducing um, autobiography more liberally. And I guess, did you feel open to doing that after sort of um, taking on a more satirical voice as sort of like a tricky inclusion, like that no one would be able, or that it would be difficult to sort of discern the two? Oh, I've always gone kind of between different voices which have different types of relationships to um, the audience or, or to other types of discourse. I don't know. I did in one video, I did a scene where I walk from my childhood home to the schoolyard where I went to school and across the way from the schoolyard is the graveyard where all my relatives are buried. I thought, okay, if I'm using this, I can't really say <laughs> anymore that I'm just using the personal or the autobiographical as um, uh, uh, it, it, yeah, so I had to, you know, as the years goes on, you have to cop to what you're actually doing. Um, yeah, it's still good to lie to yourself as an artist, but you should realize um, the limitations of <laughs> <laughs> the, the lies that aren't necessary to continue. Yeah, well, yeah, I know. I think a healthy dose of lying to oneself is good for in almost any situation, I have to say. <laughs> Um, so maybe using that as a segue to um, my question for John Paul. Um, so in, in your film, The Innocents, you are working with quite a bit of, um, of sort of uh, found materials that you bring in. So first in the image stream, and then also in the, uh, maybe my, by one degree removed in the reenactment of Capote, the Capote interview. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about uh, your process of working with sort of borrowed materials and how you use that process to sort of destabilize the maybe veracity of the documentary image. Sure. sure. I mean, the, um, I mean, I think kind of in line with Ryan and Paris too and Faraz, like I, there is a kind of collaborative process going on in the action of, of photographs. Um, these are all stills that I select that people have chosen to place online. So there are oftentimes either um, kind of reposts of a photojournalistic image or uh, a video still or a very specific selection of an image of a film or something like that. And it is, uh, I'm interested in why that, that particular frame of that particular object has been used by the user. And it largely starts and kind of moves out from there. So there's this kind of opaque or distant kind of um, relationship to a collaborator, uh, to who I don't know. And of course, I'm judging their ethical exchange with the image. And of course, I'm making my own ethical exchanges with their decisions on top of that. And then from those kind of selections, I build a sort of kind of narrative that happens outside of those images. So things are, I mean, I think there's 46 images in that image stream, uh, but I think I started with 2000 to get to there. Uh, and it was just about making compartmentalization and then into a kind of like a narrative flow that I felt was whole in some way. And what I find interesting is that, you know, that 
over the years, the kind of audience reaction to those uh, images um, has been both one of pure, abs pure, pure loss, pure kind of nonsense or pure um, indifference to kind of what the, the meaning is. And other times I'm radically shocked by how many of the kind of connections that I was thinking of or making are being kind of connected throughout all of those images. Um, and I think that there's a kind of like within that process, I really am listening to um, Capote's kind of um, speaking about his writing of In Cold Blood and thinking about a kind of bluntness to the the image itself to look at to one has to step away from that image and that relationship and the the judgment of the self and the other within the ethical kind of relationship with the image and ask questions about um, to use kind of bluntness or kind of a, a a coldness a severity to be able to to look at those things anew um, and that in itself has a kind of like fissures of of problems and um and so i think that's what's kind of generating those those choices of material great and um you talked about it a little bit but i was wondering if you could expand a bit um and anyone else who wants to jump in too about uh how you go about sort of collecting found images like is there a certain criteria that you set out looking for or are you just kind of browsing and waiting for something to to draw you in I mean, for me, I think it's, it's a, I just keep an ongoing database of images that interest me. Uh, and then they begin to kind of fit together in some way. I think for that, um, that particular work, uh, there was a number of things, but I think many of, many of the connections grew out of that uh, one image of the, the uh, US um, ambassador to Benghazi, J. Christopher Stevens, his body after after being killed in an attack, his body being carried out of the embassy in a cell phone video. And there was this, you know, whole kind of Republican, American Republican reaction to uh, the democratic handling of this issue in Benghazi and and a, a kind of positioning of of J. Christopher Stevens as queer and as his kind of his his queerness was the thing that made uh, the the embassy susceptible to attack. And someone had posted these images of him as a young man with another man kind of making a gesture to one another and it could be a completely innocent image but in the context of this kind of uh, politicization of his body his literal body and politicization of the image it began to kind of filter out from there and I think a lot of the the twinning or the kind of the the narrativizing that comes out of my image selection comes from those types of of connections that I'm making between materials. Oh, yeah, they're definitely, um, I think, you know, as a viewer, you start to feel like you are gleaning, I think, you know, a sense of your authorship through the selection process, but then also absolutely narrative, narr imposing your own narrative on them as well. Yes. Um, so just to be kind of uh, aware of the time, I was wondering if, yeah, if you guys wanted to open it up, if you had any questions for one another, or for me or anything at all. No pressure. <laughs> I guess I'm, my first question is, uh, what what attracted you to both? I think I've programmed both of these other two works in series when I program works, when I'm asked to kind of program works of my own, I'll oftentimes bring uh, uh, other artists' works with me, things that I really like and love, and I love both of these works. Uh, and so I was wondering what was what was your kind of impetus for kind of the connection between all of these the kind of like why these three works together um i so i didn't actually know i didn't know the program Hobbit love at one point when i was looking for a bio for you john paul i did see that you had programmed a bunch of coup at okay. plugin yes and i wasn't at the screening but i did see the show because i am originally from winnipeg and so i was there visiting um what brought them all together in my mind? I think when I was trying to respond to the theme of living in hope, um, I mean, a little bit, I was trying to think, I was trying to think of works that had act, that had sort of stayed with me a fair bit over the years that, um, you know, I hadn't had a chance to spend like 
a lot of time with, but that I had seen and that had somehow kind of sunk their hooks into me and sort of uh, reappeared in my brain at different stages. And so, um, I mean, just a little bit selfishly. So I brought these works together because I really like them all and I wanted sort of the opportunity to uh, luxuriate in them for an extended period of time. Um, but then I think that as a very sort of like a very loose uh, connector, I was thinking about um, about found footage as a sort of way and ways that artists use sourced material as a way of sort of overcoming, um, I don't know, critical impasses or, you know, like the Mark Fisher quote about like the uh, slow cancellation of the future, like the cessation of newness and just this perpetual pastiche but how there's a way of maybe sort of like hacking that this pastiche of true novelty or sort of generative juxtaposition through using found materials. I wanna thank everyone. Um, thank all of you artists for these uh, wonderful works. And I wanna thank Madeline for bringing them together and for being, um, uh, for being honest and saying that you uh, uh, programmed works that you really liked. Uh, it's very, it's, uh, um, it's not often that uh, I think people say that in the Curator and Incubator, so I, I appreciate that. I uh, have done that myself with uh, works by, uh, not by, uh, by Paris Du Faraz and Ryan, because I'm more recently come to that, but certainly I have with Steve and John Paul's work. So thank you all. And I just wanted to, um, I want you to stay now for, um, uh, thanks everyone who has tuned in this evening uh, to, to this conversation. And please stay on the VTAPE website because the final um, uh, program, the final title, which is Steve Renke's uh, Hobbit Love is the Greatest Love, uh, will be playing immediately afterward. And I believe you have to scroll down uh, and then you uh, hit the little triangle uh, and it will play. And all the works, all three titles will be available this week uh, uh, until October, until seven o'clock on October, Friday, October 2nd. So um, enjoy everyone. And thank you very much for uh, these great works. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Adeline. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. much. Yeah, thanks. Okay. thanks everyone. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.